Hello everyone, uh, today we're going to be talking about how to use military planning doctrine to develop better big bad evil guys for Dungeons and Dragons. Specifically we're going to be looking at Joint Pub 3-0 as well as the Army's Op Board. So the Op Board stands for Operational Order, and it's a five step planning process that the Army uses when conducting missions. The first step is to define the situation as well as mission itself. Third step is to list how the mission is going to be executed, and then the fourth and fifth describe the logistics and command and control associated with it. So what we're going to do is going to go through each of those five different steps, kind of break them up into subcomponents, and then talk about how we can use them to kind of flesh out our Dungeons and Dragons bad guys. So for situation, what we're going to do is create a map about where the action takes place. You don't have to go crazy and make an entire world map. You could make just a small subsection of a continent or a forest. Really scope it to how uh, kind of grand your bad guy is and where the action is taking place. The second is we're going to describe the situation, try to condense it down into one sentence. And then we'll pose a dramatic question about the conflict, and that's going to help us get ideas about what the adventurers are actually being asked to do. So when we create a map about where the action takes place, you have a few different options. Uh, the first of which is to just use something that's pre-generated. So there's many different modules out there from Curse of Strahd, Red Hand of Doom, uh, Minds of Phandelver that all have maps already inside of them. You could just repurpose that for your campaign or use that uh, for your campaign if you're running it just as a module. Uh, the second option is to create your own map. What I've done here, uh, on, you can see on the slide, is I just made my own map in Incarnate. You know, it doesn't have to be fancy, you can just scribble on a piece of paper. Or the third option is use something like OpenStreetMap. What this is is kind of a Google Earth uh, equivalent where you can zoom into places on the actual world, you know, that we live on, and we can kind of use that for inspiration. So I like that because it does all the work about putting down rivers and lakes and roads and things like that out for you. So you don't need to be, you know, a geography and geology expert to know, you know, uh, how, how mountains and uh, rivers are formed and things like that. So what we have here is kind of a uh, image taken from the northern part of the Bosphorus Strait. So this is slightly north of Istanbul and connects the Aegean Sea to the Black Sea. Uh, kind of what I like about it is that it kind of creates two separate continents here that are connected by one big road. Now we can put all the bad guys on one side, all the good guys on one side, and kind of create for this interesting standoff where the bad guys push into the good guy land. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to populate um, kind of good guys, bad guys, and neutral people inside our world. So what I've done is I've kind of created just a quick example. We'll say there's a guy, his name is King Norag. He is an ogre. And what he has done is created an alliance of foul creatures and kind of began his march to conquer the lands of the free people uh, all the way to the east. So I have here that he has a, you know, kind of controls a few different groups. He controls ogres, orcs, and goblins, all in this tenuous alliance. And now he is marching towards the east across this one lone bridge with his army. So then we have in green some friendly people, as well as in yellow some neutral people, so we can flesh those out now too. So maybe in green we have different human villages that the adventurers could come across. And then maybe in yellow we have different neutral parties that could ally with the adventurers, or they might not be. Perhaps there's a mad wizard that's currently being paid off uh, by King Norag, but he could be convinced uh, through the adventurers if they do something heroic. Then maybe there's elves and dwarves who desperately hate each other and refuse to ally with each other even if it means defending their common land. So now we've created this kind of situation where we've given our adventurers many different people to interact with. You see, I haven't put names of towns or names of kings or cultures, just general groups that the adventurers could interact with. And we pose a dramatic question about the conflict. So here what I wrote down is, will the heroes be able to forge an alliance between the free people and defend against the King Norag's army. So what this does is it kind of poses two real questions that the, um, the adventurers have to face. Will they be able to ally these disparate uh, people, the dwarves, elves, mad wizards, and all the humans? And will they be able to defend against King Norag's army? So this defines that they're not necessarily just trying to kill King Norag, and they're not just trying to prevent him from you know, taking a major town. They need to defend the free people from his army. So now we can go into the mission. What I've done is I've scoped this uh, same example with King Norag, but we're going to go a little more specific and focus on a specific town. 
And what we can do is we can break this up into the five W's. So I've zoomed in on this uh, small humid town. It's actually called the town of Poiraz, and we're going to break it down. So we're going to go over the who, what, when, where, and why. Specifically, we're going to be talking about an amphibious uh, landing by goblin special forces on this city. So the uh, green kind of T you see to the left, that's a blocking symbol. We'll assume that the humans got word uh, that the King Norak was coming across, and they put a valiant uh, force to defend against any movement across the bridge. But the enemy gets a vote too, and they're smart, and so what they've decided to do is send their goblin special forces to go seize the town and kind of circumvent the blocking force. You know, one of the reasons why I like using my own world and my own kind of maps is it doesn't come with the same amount of baggage that something like the Sword Coast does. So you've heard of SEAL Team 6, you know, why can't we also have some, uh, some goblins, uh, assassins in there as well? So what's going on? They're going to do an amphibious assault on the town of Poiraz. And when are they going to do this? Uh, they're going to do it on the period of darkness, May 10th. Now you could change this name. Uh, the date is arbitrary. You can use any calendar you want. I think that adds a lot of realism to a world if you can add your own calendar. And then finally, where? I just said the northern shore here. But you could get even more specific and say maybe they're going to go to the northern shore and then immediately to the capital and try to take that. And then finally, you want to go into why the enemy force is actually doing this. It's not just as simple as they want to take the town. There's always a further why. We need to look into that. So the reason why the special forces are being sent here is because they need to actually circumvent that human blocking force. They need to cut off any supply chains to that major force. And then if they can cut off the supply force, that blockading force will be forced to surrender. And then King Norag will be able to control the bridge and move all of his men, uh, weapons, equipment over safely. So now we go into execution and actually how the big bad guy is going to do his mission. So on this slide, it looks a little bit complicated, but we'll break it down. So on the x-axis, we have time, essentially how this conflict changes over time. And then on the y-axis, we have level of uh, military uh, effort. So what essentially that means is that um, different levels of military activity are going to be happening over time. So we're going to go into what each of these different types uh, actually of activities actually mean. But the takeaways is that the big bad evil guy's sub goals and actions will be changing over the course of time, whether he's doing deterring actions, dominating actions, or stabilizing actions. And big bad evil guys have a variety of non-lethal and lethal means of achieving their goals. So they may start uh, or preempt a war by doing a lot of different shaping actions to create an environment where they'll be easily able to take land. Whereas at the end, maybe they're focusing more on enabling actions and stabilizing activities. So you could have an entire campaign that takes place before or after this great conflict. You can imagine something very interesting, a very interesting intrigue campaign could take in place only using uh, shaping operations between two superpowers. Or a campaign could occur right after a conflict. Think of the, can the Eberron campaign setting uh, that takes place after a great power struggle. So we're going to go over the six different types of uh, kind of actions a military can use. The first of which is shaping. And this is essentially creating an environment that makes it easier for your army to take over land and kind of defeat the adversary. So this could be something as simple as paying off a dragon um, with money to be on your side or, you know, not help uh, the good guys. Then we go into deterring, and this is essentially over military action or uh, other types of actions that could uh, converse, uh, convince somebody to not uh, respond to your action. This could be as small as maybe kidnapping the king's daughter and saying, we're going to attack uh, these lands, and if they respond, we'll kill the king's daughter. Or could be as large as full military movements outside a country's border. You can think of this kind of as Germany flexing and threatening Great Britain and saying, this is a war between you know me and France, don't get into it. Uh, and of course, that not, doesn't always work. The third activity is seizing activities, and this is kind of your special forces or quick reaction uh, uh, operations to take land or destroy certain things. Uh, one example of this would be paratro uh, paratroopers. 
in World War II being dropped behind enemy lines and being sent to destroy railways. It could be a small team of special forces, like we saw with those goblin seals, who run in and try to take a town uh, before the big army comes by. And then dominate is exactly what it sounds like. This is full-scale military, conventional military movements. And then the last two, uh, they aren't really talked about in military conflict, but it's very important, and that is stabilizing and enable operations. So it takes a very specific bad guy to just go into a land and kill everybody who's there and then destroy everything they own. I would uh, argue that not even the most chaotic of evil type of character would do that because you simply lose all the resources and people that are there. Let's say you're a vampire, you're gonna come in and you're going to not burn down every town because you can just use their buildings, you can use their keep. Uh, you may not want to kill every single peasant because you need to use them uh, for blood. Now you can imagine half-orcs uh, or drow may take slaves, half-orcs uh, may you know, use farms and things like that. And then uh, enable and stabilize, this is also going to include different civil uh, authorities like putting in a new government. You can imagine a bandit king comes in, takes over a small town, kicks out whoever the mayor is and instates their own kind of shadow governor. Uh, a lot of times these are kind of ignored in uh, full-scale conflicts in the modern era or not put nearly as much effort into. Um, and you'll see what ends up happening is if you don't do stabilizing or enable activities, you can kind of get these insurrections that kind of happen. And you'll see that in places like uh, Taliban in Afghanistan or ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Of course, many more examples all over the world. But essentially, if you can't stabilize the people and help them, a lot of times they can uh, kind of come back to fight uh, you along over a long period of time. All of these different activities can take place uh, with different in different ratios. So uh, this is an example of a notional balance of activities for a foreign humanitarian assistance operation where it's very focused on those stabilizing and enabling activities. However, what I've done is I've crossed that out and kind of used my own example of uh, vampires taking a town hostage to be used as a blood farm. So they're not going to kill everyone there because they want to use them as almost like a cattle um, for themselves. And you could have an entire campaign that takes place after a vampire, you know, uh, royal family has taken over a town and you work just to kind of overthrow them uh, of that little town. I think that'd be an incredibly interesting campaign as well. So one thing in Dungeons and Dragons campaigns that's often skipped over is logistics. Um, but at the end of the day, armies need logistics, and this is the type of things uh, that causes uh, militaries to win wars. It's kind of an unpopular and unsexy thing, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, superpowers are superpowers because of their ability to sustain long, uh, large-scale wars uh, across the world. So we broke this into two categories, the first of which is beans, and the second of which is bullets. So uh, every living creature needs food. So they may not burn down a farm because they need to eat that food instead. Even vampires are going to need blood, so they're not just going to kill every single person they see. And then dragons might need treasure to be paid off. So you can imagine that this is the supplies that keep people running. If it's a bandit king, he's got to pay his people. Otherwise, what's the point of being in a bandit gang if you're not getting paid, right? And what that means, a couple takeaways, is that fuel will affect people's decisions. A lich may kill everyone he comes across because he wants to turn them all into undead, whereas you can imagine a human ruler may need to leave those peasants alive because what's the point of being a king if you don't have peasants? And the second takeaway that's really important is that roads and transportation matter. You can imagine in the current day how difficult it is to get supplies from one place to another. You need to put it on vehicles and transport it across highways and roads. Those are kind of like choke points where you have to go through. But imagine the olden days, if you have a wagon with a wheel, you can't just blast through a mountain and put a railway through it like we can now. So if you can control roadways, you can cut off logistics. And if an army doesn't have food, you're going to see them surrender. Uh, we saw that between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, a few months ago when they were engaged in a conflict over the Nagorno-Karabakh region, where essentially Azerbaijan had surrounded the Armenian military. Even though they only killed about 5% of their troops, the Armenians had to surrender because they had no way of getting supplies. Uh, and that's just kind of uh, the truth of the matter is that logistics matter in full-scale war. 
And the second thing to take away is bullets. So archers need arrows. In Dungeons & Dragons, we tend not to uh, keep track of things like how many arrows our characters use. An entire army would be burning through arrows in sieges. Mages need spell supplies. I looked up the uh, supplies needed for a fireball. And you know what it takes? It takes a tiny ball of bat guano and sulfur. Bat guano is bat poop. That means there is some cave somewhere where they are farming this bat poop to use for spell supplies. And if you're a half-orc, you're probably not just going to be able to go into the local apothecary store and buy his bat guano because he doesn't like you and he knows you're going to try to uh, take over his town. And then the last one uh, example we have here is bandits or recruits need swords. So uh, not just those arrows and spell supplies, but also if you are a army moving through a land and you're raising more zombies or recruiting more uh, conscripts, you're going to need to arm them. And what that means is that all the production matters too. There are blacksmiths that could be attacked because there's never enough weapons to be used in a war. Uh, I think we've all seen those uh, World War II movies where you saw some Russians who had two people to one gun and each had five bullets themselves. Uh, this is what happens in full-scale war when entire countries are mobilized is you simply don't have the amount of supplies you need and because of that production sources become very important. Uh, this is why you saw in, in conflicts like World War II where um, firebombing was used against production centers and petroleum oil and lubrication facilities and not actual military uh, bases. Kind of the final question here is, what about prisoners of war? If you're a uh, dark elf, you may be taking slaves. If you're a vampire, you may be taking, you know, this cattle. And if you're humans, you're probably taking prisoners of war, uh, unless you, you know, kill everyone you see and be labeled, uh, you know, the evil guy for all of eternity. It's not how you, uh, you know, do stabilizing or enabling operations, right? So I'd also ask, what is going on with the prisoners of war, uh, and can your adventurers spring them? So if you take these two together uh, of logistics, of beans and bullets, it really helps flesh out your world. I think your players will be really interested to kind of see behind the uh, the screen and see all the work you've done in terms of, you know, uh, different adventures that can come out of this. Maybe your adventurers could attack supply lines or attack prediction facilities or cut off these payments for the army. And how would that affect your story? I think it creates a few very interesting hooks you could explore. So the final thing we're going to be talking about is command and control. Essentially, this is who is in charge and how is their information and orders being disseminated down to the lowest levels. So one question is who's actually in charge? You may have a king who is ordering his army to move around, but is he the actual one who's causing the war or is it a mind flare that's possessed him? Is it centralized or decentralized? The extreme of a centralized army would be something like a lich where he has complete control of every zombie down to the lowest level. Whereas decentralized could be something like a bandit king who has disparate bandit gangs or thieves guild all throughout the area. They may be doing operations without him knowing or even against his will because he has such decentralized control over them. And then finally, who are the successors? In your campaign, if the adventurers slay the big bad evil guy, does the enemy force just simply crumble and fall without a leader, or does someone step up to take their place? And then we go into signals, and this is how those orders get passed down. So the big bad evil guy is in charge of many people, but how is he getting the message out to all of them? You know, there's a few different ways that this could be this could happen. You know, in real world, we have things like internet and radio, and there aren't exactly perfect analogs for those in Dungeons and Dragons. But you can imagine a kind of group of wizards all using the sending spell to each other. Uh, is it you know ravens with a message attached to their leg? Is it uh, people on horseback running messages around. So looking into how the big bad evil guy gets out his message and sends his orders to the people is also very important. And who actually receives these? The lowest drogue of this military or group of big bad evil guys has maybe never even talked to the big bad guy. They may just be told and barked orders by one of his lieutenants. And then the final thing here is, is there intentional misinformation? So one thing that the Russians were famous for in World War II as well is that uh, they would actually have fake maps 
on them that not even the soldiers using them would know. It would be accurate just to the location uh, they were in, but the locations of you know crucial uh, equipment locations or roads or bridges would be totally wrong. And these were purposely sent to the Germans so they would not know where uh, actual Russian equipment uh, and things like that were. So it is a big, big bad guy sending out purposeful uh, uh, misinformation. And then we can create a organizational chart or org chart uh, here for the command and control. And what I really like about this is it allows you to break down who is talking to who and what method they're using to do that. So in this example, we kind of have a big bad evil guy. Maybe this is a uh, kind of a mind flayer or chaotic evil advisor who is giving orders to a senile king who is kind of has the divine authority uh, in the area and he passes it down to his loyal support commander and operations commanders. People below the king don't know that they're carrying out evil commands. They think they're just doing the king's words, but in reality, he's being controlled by a big bad evil guy. And then we can look at how those orders are being passed down. Maybe the operations commander is sending courier letters to all his armies, whereas the support commander is using a sending stone to talk to his spy network. That's going to change how fast information can flow, as well as if the uh, player characters can actually kind of uh, steal this information on its route, or even send their own false information. I also like how if you um, create one of these org charts, you can see how the big bad evil guy may be controlling several different groups who don't actually talk to each other. This uh, big bad evil guy being something like a mind flayer, and he has control over a king. He also may have possessed a bandit lord, and he even might have cultists underneath him. So all three of those groups could be fighting against each other and making it look like they all have a different leader, when in reality, it's the same big bad evil guy. So I, I uh, suggest you use this org chart, if for nothing else, to kind of brainstorm ideas about how fast information travels from place to place and kind of who talks to who. I think you'll find that really enriches uh, your uh, big bad evil guy and uh, how he gets information out. So uh, that concludes uh, the discussion we have for today. I went over the uh, operational order and the five steps in order to kind of apply to Dungeons and Dragons and see if we can make a better big bad evil guy. So the steps were to define the situation and mission, go over the details of how that mission is going to be executed, and then we talked about the importance of logistics and command and control. So I really appreciate you guys listening. I hope you enjoyed this uh, video, and I'll talk to you soon.